coming. It's a pleasure to see so many people here. Uh, I'm Roly Keating, I'm Chief Executive here at the British Library. And um, tonight we have the First World War, the debate. And I think the fact that this is a sold out event uh, gives a sense of just how much energy, curiosity, passion, uh, and, and just desire really to think and reflect there is in the air. Uh, particularly, I think, in the last month or so, I think ever since uh, uh, this, this historical debate found its way deep into the political consciousness, into the, to the public life of the nation, uh, Michael Gove's intervention, uh, the response from Sir Richard Evans, something happened that made us uh, want to take this further. And I hope uh, one of the things the British Library can do as an institution uh, is provide, if you like, a safe space for big ideas to be thought through uh, and for people to understand and question and maybe question themselves. And I'm sure that's what's going to happen uh, over the next hour and a half. Uh, we try to do other things here as well, uh, particularly in commemoration uh, of the 1914-18 conflict. Uh, we are a research library. We're very proud, of course, to be able to put primary research materials out there onto the web increasingly. Uh, for everyone to have access to and explore. Some of you may be familiar with uh, the Europeana 1914-18 project where uh, collections all over Europe are being published online together. Uh, some 400,000 items never before available, uh, not just from the traditional archival collections, but also materials from, from personal collections. Uh, there have been road shows all over Europe. Uh, where private papers have been brought out and we participated in that. From that material, we've also published very recently uh, our own website for a, an educational purpose primarily. It, it's, it's, a, it's focused on what can be done for young people in classrooms, but I hope you will all find our World War I website because there's material uh, of great interest uh, um, for anyone interested in the period. And beyond that, as the year unfolds, um, there'll be events, conferences. Uh, Kate Aidy will be here talking about women in the war. Uh, and June the 19th, we'll see the opening of a free exhibition in our main uh, public space here at the library uh, called Enduring War, Grief, Grit and Humour, uh, about the personal experience, home front and on the front, uh, how people coped. And of course, that's what journals and poems and manuscripts can, can reveal so clearly. We're also an active research institution, uh, and I'm delighted to say it is one of our active <coughs> researchers, one of the uh, collaborative doctoral students we have working here, Vincent Trott, um, and in fact he's working with Annika on the panel, uh, who suggested that we do this, uh, that the moment had come, uh, and we should seize the moment to have the debate. Uh, and uh, thank you, Vince, wherever you are, but uh, it's del I'm delighted that a, from a spark like that, we can assemble at such a distinguished panel. Uh, I'm not going to do those, that introduction, however. I'm going to hand to our chair for the evening, uh, historian and journalist Paul Lay, uh, former editor, founding editor, in fact, of BBC History magazine, a senior research fellow at the University of Buckingham. Uh, uh, he's on the advisory board of the Institute of Historical Research, but you may well know him as the editor of History Today. Uh, Paul, please introduce the panel. Thank you, um, thank you really. Um, We've got a very distinguished panel here. I should say something about the way this came about. Um, it's a great initiative by uh, the British Library because it actually came about from a Twitter conversation uh, that was born of uh, the debate that, well, we'll call it a controversy uh, between Gove and Richard Evans and Tristram Hunt that was there and people like Simon Sharma became involved and Gary Sheffield, I think, was the, the main agent there. And Gary is one of our guests today, and the, the BL responded tremendously quickly and put together this debate. It didn't even feature in the what's on listings. Um, so, um, and I, I think that the number of people who have turned up here is practically a sold out event. 280 people shows that uh, Great War fatigue has not set in yet. Um, uh, and it looks as though it won't at all. Um, so anyway, I will introduce you to the panel uh, on my far left is Gary Sheffield, who is Professor of War Studies at the University of Wolverhampton, where he's uh, a recent appointment. He was formerly at Birmingham uh, University, and he's written mainly, I suppose, he's most famous for his work on Douglas Haig, uh, which is, of course, revisionism, 
Uh, he's associated with Somme, The Forgotten Victory, The First World War, Myths and Realities, all uh, fantastic books that have reassessed entirely uh, our understanding of the First World War. On my left is Dr. Annika Mombauer, who is Senior Lecturer in Modern European History at the Open University. And I think that anyone who wants to engage with uh, the First World War and really wants to go back to the sources should get a copy of uh, Origins of the First World War, Controversies and Consensus, and a recent publication from Oxford University too that looks at the sources there. You can actually look at uh, uh, the, uh, and well, hear the words from the horse's mouth there. And it's very, very valuable to go back to those sources and to see and escape anachronism and hear the voices of the period. On my right is Dr. Dan Todman, who's senior lecturer at Queen Mary University of London, who engages with the social, military, and cultural history of the Great War, looking at its course and its legacy in particular. He's the author of the book, The Great War, Myth and Memory. And on my far right, though not necessarily politically, is Dr. Neil Faulkner, <laughs> who is a research fellow at Bristol University, and uh, interestingly, a First World War archeologist, a high profile Marxist historian, it says here. And he uh, is a politically engaged one too, uh, he wrote the Stop the War Coalition pamphlet, No Glory, The Real History of the First World War. So we have a wide range of opinions here, but we also have serious academic engagement with the subject. And I think that's very important because no subject is quite as riddled with myth as the First World War. And I think what we want to do today is to do what Hugh Strawn has asked us to do, and that is engage in controversy that controversy is the means by which we will best understand this war, but controversy, contention, <coughs> that is informed by the tremendous amount of academic um, history that's been produced in recent times. Myths do arise very quickly. Um, I was thinking of Michael Gove's intervention. I'm not one of those people who just has a knee-jerk negative reaction to Gove. Uh, some things he says are interesting, some things aren't and some things are faintly ridiculous. And what was ridiculous was the point about the arguments over the origins of First World War, of the apportioning of guilt and blame being a left-right split. It's certainly anything but that. If one considers that John Charmley, Neil Ferguson, Dominic Sandbrook, John Redwood, and of course, originally, Alan Clark are of the left then one is confused. Um, but those are all people who have argued uh, that uh, Britain did not benefit or Britain should not have taken part in the First World War. So I want to start this debate uh, by going in at the deep end and by asking each of the speakers to mark out their positions as to the origins of the First World War, where guilt, where blame is manifest, if indeed it is at all. So I'll start with Dan. Dan Top. Uh, well, actually, I, mean, I think uh, uh, it's, it's interesting to be asked to, to place yourself in that position as a result of uh, uh, a debate initiated by Michael Gove to promote his own position as scourge of the left, uh, rather than to make any kind of contribution to the history of the First World War. Uh, but uh, yeah, along with Paul, I think sometimes there's a, there's a function for people driving debate, even if it, that's not actually their, uh, uh, you know, their intention is different from that of historians. Um, for me, what's interesting about that uh, rather manufactured debate was how much it focused on Britain's participation rather than the mechanics of Europe going to war. So, I mean, um, as ever, these discussions were about, uh, were as if they were sort of um, ab initio, as if nobody had thought about these issues before. Whereas actually, it's a kind of tribute to 100 years of Britain's debating is this a war that was worth it? Was it worthwhile? Should Britain enter? So I think we need to recognise this is something which was controversial at the time and which has continued to be controversial since. And in a way, that's a distinctly British argument in the sense that it's because Britain has a choice uh, about whether it takes part in 1914 in the way that other countries I don't think feel they have the same way. It's not invaded. So I think identifying this as a distinctly British argument is probably something that I'm, uh, I'm most interested. That's a way of avoiding taking a position. Well, let me try and force you on that. Did they make the right decision? <laughs> I mean, well, I see it depends what you mean by right. That's a good story to answer, isn't it? Because what it, it seems to me that uh, uh, if we make an argument, if we accept an argument that Britain needs to take part for sort of geopolitical reasons, um, you know, which, which might be an argument, for example, that Gavin might make, 
uh, uh, now we're, I won't cast him into a particular position, but uh, th then we have to accept there's a particular value to, to the nation that exists in 1914, and perhaps we have to draw linkages to the one that exists now. I think that's why I, I'm, I'm anxious about saying this is something that is right for Britain to do, because it was, it may be, it may have been right for the Britons of 1914, and many of them certainly thought they were engaged in a righteous conflict. Uh, I, I think that the Britain of 2014 is so different from the Britain of 1914 that it would be very dangerous to say this is a just war, for example, uh, because to me that's to draw on the rhetoric of the time, to uh, uh, you know, in a sort of false way. Um, does it matter to Britain that? it ends up on the winning side if there's a war to be won. You know, if, there's a war, if the war is going to be fought, Britain, you know, it, it's an important facet of British history in the 20th century that it's on the winning side. I don't think you can understand what happens in Britain in the 20s and 30s, its reaction to uh, the course of uh, the rest of 20th century history without saying victory matters. But that's not the reason that it enters battle. Uh, in the summer of 1940. And of course even victory, um, in terms of someone like Ferguson, would be Pyrrhic. Um, <coughs> we'll probably deal with those issues later. Now, Annika, mm. your position. Okay, well I think um, I completely agree with you that you know this focus on Britain is important and also somewhat curious. We, we, we talk of the First World War, but actually what we're looking at, we're always just looking at Britain's war, we're always looking at the Western Front. and. Um, and all the associations we have with the war. So it's quite important to think of the origins um, internationally, but also to think of this debate internationally. And while we've been debating in this country, um, in Germany a parallel debate has been going on, which is very interesting. And at the moment I think it's no longer parallel, but the two have crossed. Um, so here we've debated, I'd say until about six weeks ago, the main debate was about how to commemorate the war. Um, there wasn't really much debate that it should be commemorated, and I'm sure all of us would agree that something um, should happen to commemorate the war, but how do you commemorate it? And, and historians have been quite uh, worried about the fact that the government seemed to only want to commemorate defeats rather than perhaps also the fact that some battles were actually won and that in the end Britain was, as we just said, on the winning side. Um, that debate hasn't taken place at all in Germany where the government uh, doesn't want to commemorate the war at all. There are local regional initiatives but there is no um, concern by the German government to commemorate the war in, in a national way. Um, so the debate, while we've now been um, debating what, what Gove and others have said in this you know, really fascinating debate, and I love the fact that what we all do for a day job has suddenly just become what everybody's interested in, and that's just really wonderful. Um, but while we've been debating whether or not the war was futile for Britain, um, in Germany they've been debating whether or not Germany actually caused the war, because they've in a way got their get-out-of-jail card, um, in the form of um, a couple of publications that have made a huge splash in Germany, one of which is Chris Clark's Sleepwalkers, um, which has been available in German translation since September and is an absolute barnstorming success. Um, last I heard, it sold 160,000 copies. I mean, that's something I'm sure we can all just dream about. And I would say until quite recently, I don't know, I don't want to talk for you, but I, I, I dream about it. <laughs> Um, but until quite recently, I'd say unless it was a book about the Second World War, you had no chance of ever topping the bestseller lists. But suddenly, the First World War is very present in Germany, and the debate there is about whether or not Germany caused it, and the current consensus is, well, actually, no, Germany didn't cause it, it was everyone. Um, and where the two debates now merge um, is that some German historians have picked up on this futility argument and they are quite certain that Britain could have stayed out of the war. And it's quite astonishing to read that. They say that Britain was pretty much the only country who had no um, actual reason to go to war in 1914 and that it was the entry of Britain into the war that turned that European war into a global war. So they completely turn it on its head, which is really quite astonishing and worrying to read. Um, but in terms of declaring a position, um, um, after 100 years, I'd still say that essentially the Allies got it right in 1919 and that Germany is more to blame than anyone else and that Britain should not have um, stayed out of the war. I think we're, we're approaching this with hindsight, but what we need to do is look at what were the options 
for Sir Edward Grey in 1914, and I just can't see how he could possibly have decided uh, for Britain to stay neutral. It wasn't possible because it's not just Germany that's threatening Britain, it's also Russia. In the, um, in the understanding of the Foreign Office, Russia will be, um, by 1916-17, everybody in Europe thinks Russia will be an invincible power. So what can, what can Sir Edward Grey do? He can stay neutral, then he's let down France and Russia. He's no longer got a credible ally on the continent. There is really actually no choice that I can see um, for a different decision. So it's, it's not really a very um, um, an apt question to ask, could they have stayed up? Because in that, in that constellation in 1914, and given the values that people had, I mean, James John speaks of unspoken assumptions. There are actually lots of spoken assumptions. They're about honor, they're about prestige. These are things that today we can't really quite understand anymore. But at the time, um, Austria-Hungary did go to war partly because of prestige and honor. Those were the reasons. And Britain and Germany and France and Russia all thought in those terms. So I think they needed, um, that their hand was forced, they needed to enter this war, but their hand was forced primarily by Germany. Well, thank you, Annika. Um, I'm sure we'll discuss uh, Christopher Clark's sleepwalkers later. I mean, do you, do you think, just a quick question, is part of the appeal of that in Germany, because I was astonished by the number of uh, copies it sold I found out last week, um, is that because it presents, dare I say, it, a flattering picture of uh, Germany? 1914 and in the build-up to that. Well, I think that would uh, do uh, Chris Clark a disservice. The no, book not being Chris Clark, I'm talking yeah. about commercial success. Oh, right, the commercial, well, no, it's a fine yeah. piece of scholarship. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, yes, it is a fine piece of scholarship. It's also extremely well written. And it was uh, published and marketed at just the right moment in time. So he's lucky in that his book was the first. Now there is an absolute avalanche of books on the First World War, also in Germany. Um, and it's, I think, much harder now to stake that claim. Most people who bought the book will probably only buy one whopper of a book. Um, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to go and read everything that there is. So it was partly timing. It's partly that it's very readable. But it is also that a lot of people um, in the media and in the German public, where this has been debated. Um, in an unprecedented way, it really reminds me of the Fisher controversy of the 1960s where there was a similar interest and a similar public debate that you don't normally get in this way. Um, and it is, if you get, for example, <coughs> one thing that you can do is look on Amazon and other such sites for the comments that people leave. And it is absolutely astonishing how many comments, how long, how knowledgeable people are, but also how they, you know, they do say, well, finally, Somebody says it wasn't us. We can't have been, you know, the baddies in everything. And the fact that he's not German is particularly significant and often pointed out. He's an Australian scholar working in Cambridge. He's got no, um, you know, ulterior motives. He's got no axe to grind. If he says it wasn't us, then I guess it wasn't us. So. <laughs> okay. <coughs> What's your position? Well, you see, it's very interesting that Annika refers to Sir Edward Grey and poses the question, what should Edward Grey, Sir Edward Grey uh, do? And there's a tendency, I think, among academic historians to assume that if they were to be transported back to the period that they study 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 200 years ago, they would be reincarnated as a great statesman or general or a senator if they study the ancient world or whatever. And I want to suggest that we really need to think about the, the First World War in a different way. Um, because there are two ways of looking at history. There have been two ways of looking at history, actually, for about 5,000 years since the world was divided into rich and poor. And in 1914, there were two Europes. Not just two Europes in the sense that there was an Entente alliance and a Central Powers alliance. There was another sense, a more important sense, in which there were two Europes. There was a Europe of rulers, of industrialists, of bankers, and of generals. And if you view history from above, that's what you see. And you see one group of bankers and industrialists and, and, and generals gathered around a Union Jack in one place, 
And as you pan across, you see another group of bankers and industrialists and generals gathered around a French tricolour. And then you pan around a little further and you see another group of them gathered around a German cross. And they're competing with each other. They're competing for empire. They're competing for markets. They're competing for raw materials. They've gobbled up the rest of the planet among themselves and now that war for empire and profit has rebounded into Europe, created an arms race, and that plunges Europe into war. A war of the great powers, a war of the great empires in 1914. That's, the, that's what you see if you look at the top, if you take the perspective of Sir Edward Grey. But there's another way of looking at 1914. You can look from below. You can look at the experience of the mine worker on strike against poverty pay in South Wales and compare him with the mine worker on strike against poverty pay in the Rhineland or the Czech mine worker in Bohemia or the Russian mine worker in the Don Basin. And their enemy isn't other mine workers who've been put into uniform and sent by their rulers to kill foreign mine workers. Their enemy is the mine boss. You can look at history that way. You can look at history from the perspective of the suffragettes fighting for the right to vote, who have no say in whether or not the British ruling class decides to go to war in 1914. You can look at the war from the perspective of the Irish nationalist, for whom the enemy is the British Empire, not Germany. You can look at it from the perspective of the Indian nationalist. Let's remind ourselves that the British, who in 1914 adopt a holier-than-thou attitude to Germany, arguing that Germany is the aggressor, Germany is autocratic, Germany is threatening the peace of Europe, it was the British who controlled a fifth of the world's landmass and a quarter of the world's population. Hundreds of millions of people living under British imperial rule in order to enrich a tiny minority of bankers and industrialists at the top of British society and the British ruling class in defence of that empire and in defence of that wealth were willing to plunge Britain into a war that cost 15 million lives. Look at history from below and it's not a question about what Sir Edward Grey should have done, but a question about what ordinary people should have done when their rulers made the decision to plunge Europe into four years of modern industrialised slaughter. If what happened between 1914 and 1918 isn't madness, isn't a world gone mad, isn't the proof that this system was a dysfunctional system, I don't know what is. So, are you saying, are you, are you talking about what the European working class should have done, or what they did? Do you want to come straight back? Yeah. yeah, yeah so, so, I, so yeah. I guess, I mean, I, I, because I, I take a lot of your points about, you know, Britain, uh, uh, you know, the British Empire is not something one would now wish to fight for, it, and uh, uh, it being a war of empires, that's an important way to think about it. Uh, but it strikes me that there's an awful lot of South Wales miners who end up joining the armed forces, there's a lot of people across Europe who end up, you know, one of the great factors of uh, explaining that outbreak of war is the failure of European socialism to prevent it. No, I mean, that is absolutely right. And it seems to me that the leaders of the mainstream socialist parties and the trade unions in 1914 across Europe, with some noble exceptions, but they were a minority, betrayed the interests of their own supporters. I would put it as strongly as that, because the socialist parties organized together in a second international and many of the trade unions had passed resolutions year after year after year at their conferences in the, in the run-up to war saying we will take mass action against war if it's declared. I mean, many of them were committed 
to calling general strike action to stop the war. <coughs> My view is they should have acted on that, and then we would have avoided the ten, uh, the four, the four years of war between 1914 and 1918. We wouldn't have had to wait for that eruption of anti-war opinion from below that finally does bring the war to an end in 1917 and 1918, but only after 50 million people have been killed. And with very poor terms uh, that are imposed by Germany there as well. But beyond that, do you not think just one question that rises out of that, and I, I very much agree about the importance of understanding uh, history from below as well as above, but the way it's understood now, uh, there could be an argument that the social history, the way we understand what has become social history, at least so far as public history goes, has become divorced from the politics and the diplomacy, so that we see very much a solipsistic kind of who do we think we are culture, where we trace our family, we trace our culture. We no longer, perhaps it's due to the decline of Marxism, one of, one of the... Uh, one of the, the sad parts of the decline of Marxism is that we no longer think of those social structures in terms of at least the way public history is presented. And so the kind of arguments that you're making, which are perfectly valid arguments, are not ones that are really getting through to the wider public um, because we tend to concentrate on the individual and then we can tend to concentrate on the high politics and don't merge the two anymore. But anyway, let's, let's move to Gary Sheffield, who I think will have probably a different take on this. Gary. <laughs> Well, I um, was rather embarrassed by Michael Gove's comments because he sort of fingered me implicitly as a right-wing historian. I'm a soft, squishy Guardian reader, and I had a series of texts from various friends of mine who work in the state school <coughs> system saying, do you have any, any um, influence over your new best friend's policies? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, my belief, and I must say I, I have been very influenced by reading Annika's work and, and work of many other historians, is that war was caused in 1914 by the deliberate and conscious decision of the ruling elite of two states, of Austria-Hungary and of Germany. Austria clearly used the assassination of the Archduke as a pretext to go to war with Serbia. They wanted to crush Serbia for a matter of prestige. It was the last, the Balkans was the last place in Europe that the Austrians could still throw their weight around. And <coughs> it seems very clear to me that they were determined to go to war no matter what. What I think is the crucial um, activity of the Germans, and uh, I, I certainly would agree with, with Annika that the Germans are very largely to blame, was the issuing of the so-called blank check, the, uh, the blanket um, guarantee of support for Austria no matter what they were going to do. And both Austria and Germany, the, all the leaders, we're talking about very small groups, very cliques in both cases, took those decisions in the full knowledge of the likely outcome, which would be that a war would not be confined to the Balkans, that it would bring in Russia, which, in, which ran the hugely strong risk of converting it to a general European war. Now, some historians, uh, Fritz Fischer's already been mentioned, um, John Roll, whose magisterial third volume of his biography of the Kaiser has just appeared, would argue that there is conscious intent by the Germans to seek to carve out an empire in Europe. Others would say, okay, maybe that's not precisely what they're aiming to do, but at the very least, the German elite are prepared to run the risk of bringing about a war like that in order to achieve, at the bare minimum, breaking up the entente of, Aust uh, of, of France and Russia with Britain on the sidelines. Peacefully, okay, but if it comes to war, so be it. So the very best thing you can say about the leaders of Germany and Austria-Hungary is they were prepared to take criminal risks, I use the word advisedly, with the peace of Europe. It strikes me that the Sleepwalkers thesis very much speaks to our time, to a time in which we don't want to allocate blame. Uh, Chris Clark and Richard Evans have actually gone on record as saying that we should get away from the blame game. This strikes me as being frankly ahistorical, that the evidence to me is absolutely clear. Whatever their motivations, those two states, 
bear the war guilt, the, birth, the huge burden of the war guilt. Uh, whatever you might say about the leaders of Britain, France, and particularly Russia, their actions, I think, were largely defensive and reactive. Could Britain stay out of the war? No, it couldn't. Um, the geopolitical reasons, which Dan has already referred to, I think are desperately important. If we see the British uh, decision to go to war in 1914 as part of a continuum, it goes back at least to the uh, age of Queen Elizabeth, that's to keep the Low Countries, the Netherlands and Belgium, out of the hands of a hostile power, particularly a hostile uh, naval power, is you know, one of the, 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 the primary principles upon which, the, which British security and foreign policy are constructed. The wider issue, of course, is the balance of power. The Britain has historically sought to prevent the domination of Europe by any one power, and thus allied with Germany, or at least German states, against France uh, under Napoleon, and allied with France against Germany uh, 100 years later. Britain basically went into the Second World War in 1939 for the same reason, joined NATO in 1949 for essentially the same reason. The other thing, the other issue, which I must say has actually loomed much, uh, I, I've come to believe is much more important than I did in right, when I did some writing on this about a decade ago, is the moral case. It's clear to me that people in Britain, particularly the non-conformist conscience, were so outraged by the invasion of Belgium, uh, Germany ripping up a treaty, that it certainly brought, I think, uh, Asquith's government into the war more or less united. It, it brought Lloyd George on board, certainly. Um, we've got so used to politicians lying, we think nothing of it anymore. But in 1914, they thought differently. So the moral case, as well as, as the strategic case, I think is absolutely critical. Um, the final thing I'll say, actually, is even if we could sort of, you know, somehow may wave a magic wand and discover that... Uh, Chris Clark's sleepwalker's <laughs> thesis is in fact correct. The way that Germany then proceeded to behave once war had broken out with the September programme, uh, not only the policy but actual, uh, the plans rather, the actual policy of annexations <coughs> in the East and West, the treatment of occupied uh, states, and the threat, the absolute dire threat that this posed to the very existence of Britain as a sovereign state, makes the First World War for all the fact it's a terrible, absolutely ghastly experience, a war which had to be fought and had to be won. Um, nobody in Britain really wanted war in 1914. There's a very, I think, if, if Germany had avoided going through Belgium, I think there's an extremely good chance Britain would have either stayed out of the war altogether or possibly have not come in until several weeks or even months later uh, because the Asquith government had fallen apart which I think probably would have meant that Germany would have won and France and, and Russia would have lost. It's not a war anybody in Britain really wanted in 1914, but it's a war that people at the time, from the very top of society to the very bottom, recognised the threat and recognised as a war that had to be fought and had to be endured. And I put my hands on, a t on, on my, my, my cards on the table. I'm, for one, profoundly glad that our ancestors took that decision, fought the war and ended up on the winning side. Thank you. Can I, um, can, can I just yeah. make one point? Um, I've, got a, I've got a quote here. It's, it, it's very interesting what you say about the reluctance that there was uh, in Britain um, to fight. I'm sure that's true. Um, I've got a quote here from uh, a leftish academic journalist, Gilbert Murray, who very much opposed the war and wrote in 1915, I have never till this year seriously believed in the unalterably aggressive designs of Germany. Now I see that on a large part of this question I was wrong, and a large number of people whom I honour most were wrong. One is vividly reminded of Lord Melbourne's dictum, all the sensible men were on one side and all the damn fools on the other, and egad sir, the damn fools were right. Now the damn fools he's talking about were people like Lord Roberts, Lord Kitchener, Lord Milner, people who wanted to create in the years running up to the war a much stronger army. The British army was very, very small. It relied on its naval power for its strength. Is there any sense that the war could have been av avoided had Britain been more militaristic? Well, the argument has certainly been made um, that if Britain had introduced conscription, uh, had effectively had a continental army to back up its quasi-alliance with Britain, 
uh, so sorry, with, with France and Russia before 1914. That's that's a possibility. But, but of course, it was never going to happen because Britain before 1914 was simply never going to allow conscription to come in. So yes, might be, but really not. I think worth debating not because practical. it was never going to happen. Never practical politics. But also, I can't, I can't see that it's in Britain. If we're talking national interests, I can't see that it's in Britain's national interests to fight like France and Germany or Russia when it's not France or Germany or Russia. It's the world. It's the workshop of the world. Yeah. It doesn't have an agricultural peasant class. <coughs> you know, it, it, what it's very good at is making stuff. Yeah. Uh, so it should fight a war based on high technology, which is what it does. Well, it, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah, so right. and, and, and of course, you're sort of, you know, if you say that Britain should have had a big army, well, you know, you're kind of missing out the role that the British Navy plays in eventually winning the war. You know, so I think, uh, uh, I'm not sure that just because Gilbert Murray thought that the damn fools were right, that Kitchener was right to say we would have a big army. It's interesting, of course, it doesn't end up being deployed in the way he wanted it deployed anyway, which has led everybody else in Europe fight themselves to a standstill and then dis determine the beats. You know, so, yeah, wars don't end up how people think they're going to be at the start. Um, was there uh, any means, uh, historians refer to the court of arbitration, at the Hague for example, um, was there any peaceful means by which it could have been resolved through such methods as arbitration? <coughs> I mean, are you aware of any such methods? That could have avoided the conflict. That could have avoided the conflict. Um, that were based upon Congress. No, not really, because you see, um, if you have a world which is divided, um, as the world of 1914 was, between rival European nation states uh, creating empires and spheres of influence in America, Asia, <coughs> and Africa, and building great armies uh, to back their position both in Europe and, and, and in the wider world, you don't have the material basis for international cooperation to resolve conflicts um, of this nature. You have to overturn what was a profoundly, and still is, a profoundly dysfunctional global system, where instead of having um, a world in which there is international unity and solidarity and a resolution of human problems collectively and democratically in a rational way, by agreement of us all, as uh, a species, if you have a world that is divided in this way into nation states and corporations that are competing with each other, if that's the dynamic of the system, it doesn't matter what international institutions you set up. It doesn't matter if you set up a League of Nations. It doesn't matter if you set up the United Nations. It doesn't matter what kind of international organization uh, you set up. You are not going to be able to prevent war, which is intrinsic to a system which is divided and competitive in the way the modern capitalist world is the world that has given us a century of war. Yeah, it's a pipe dream. To come back. Um, yes, there could have been. The war could have been stopped by international mediation. Um, Sir Edward Gray, on, I think on six, six separate occasions, proposed either an international conference or mediation. Now, in the past two years, uh, that is 1912-1913, the Balkan Wars um, had seen a revival of the old concert of Europe, where actually the great powers sitting around, around the table, both to uh, prevent the war from spreading and actually to decide in some cases on, um, to put it crudely, which, which state was going to get which, which chunk, chunk of territory. And all the indications from 1912-1913 was that Grey actually was quite sympathetic to the Habsburg case. Uh, Vernon Bogdanar, uh, a very important lecture uh, sometime last year, and I think it's coming out in, it's the, it's, it's the core of a book that's coming out late, later this year, has made the point, I thought very, very, very forcefully, that it is entirely possible, had the Austrians and Germans been serious about peace, which of course they were not, that had they been serious about it, there could have been an international conference ending with Serbia being punished, uh, isolated, although not just dis dis destroyed. Um, so war could have been avoided. The Austrians could have got some sort of revenge for the, for the assassination. The Russians wouldn't have been drawn in. But such things only, act such peace processes only actually work if the principal parties are serious about it. Russia was serious, France was serious, Britain was serious, Serbia, you remember any choice, I suspect, but serious, Germany and Austria were not. But it's even worse than that, isn't it, that they actually say in Vienna after the assassination that a diplomatic victory would be odious. 
we do not want a diplomatic victory. This time, particularly the uh, Chief of Staff in Vienna, Franz Konrad von Hötzendorf, who's been absolutely gagging for a war with Serbia for some time. Um, every kind of crisis, he wants to have a war with Serbia. This is his moment. <coughs> the last thing he wants is arbitration or mediation. And as you say, there are all these offers on the table. They get dismissed out of hand um, in Berlin and in Vienna. And what Berlin, what the leaders in Berlin do is they say, we will pretend to pass on your mediation proposal, uh, but please don't be fooled by this. We don't want you in Vienna to mediate, but we can't lose face, so we have to appear to be in support of the offers that are coming from, from Sir Edward Grey. And as you say, there's this tradition of solving um, crises around the conference table, mm -hmm. um, and I can't see why this couldn't have worked again if there'd been the desire to resolve it. Just, just well, one point there. Sure. Edward Grey has come on for an awful lot of criticism from a whole series of historians, normally for not being tough enough, and I think that, that completely misunderstands politically how weak he is within the Liberal government, let alone anything else. Um, I, for me, his biggest mistake is actually believing the international processes which have worked as recently as six months before will work in the summer of 1916, uh, 1914, I'm sorry. His mistake is believing the Germans and the Austrians are serious about peace when they are not. Just to, just to follow up on a point that Neil made earlier, I mean, it seems to me that you one of the problems with trying to stop the war once it's on, you know, uh, two or three years in, is the level of popular commitment throughout Europe to it. But actually, you know, these these wars can't just be fought by great statesmen. They they can only be fought with popular consent. And actually, because they because uh, there isn't that uh, that kind of universal enthusiasm that I think people used to believe in in 1914. Actually, you would have had popular support for a peace settlement. You know, a peaceful resolution. Uh, uh, in 1914, it would have been politically possible uh, domestically as well as internationally. But of course, once the war is underway, by the time you get to 1916, 1917, that's much harder to achieve uh, because it's you know, politically much more difficult on the home front. And mentalities are hugely different. I don't think we can underestimate them. Can we? The mentality of people there, if you're thinking of the Russian soldier fighting the church and fatherland, you know, Christian patriotic duties in for all the time. Rupert Brooke writes at the beginning, you know, now God be thanked who has watched us with, with, um, with this hour. I mean, th these are sentiments that are unimaginable to us, but in terms of the mentality of that period, they are, they are very real, and that is what people believe. It's very difficult, but I want to try and move on, because I realize we're really racing through time here, and I want to look at the legacy um, of the war and the way we understood it, and why <coughs> Britons are so fascinated by it. And I want to look at the idea of a good war versus bad war. When Britons look back at the Second World War, it's almost universally accepted as the right thing to do. It's almost Manichaean in the way good versus evil. There is little regret, despite the suffering uh, that's endured there. It was the right thing to do. That is not the way, on the whole, the First World War is thought of anymore, and perhaps hasn't been thought of over the last 50 years. And Dan, I wonder if you could talk about the way in which that's changed. Because you do get criticism of strategy, for example, even with people like Churchill, Lord George, Basil Little Hart, right from the beginning. But nevertheless, they sense that the war is still a, the right thing to afford. It's still right to go to war, even if the strategy is wrong. We <coughs> think of books like by Frank Richards, Frederick Manning, J.C. Dunn, that are ambivalent, I suppose, ambiguous about the war, but still relatively positive about the legacy of it. That changes. I wonder if you could sort of yeah, chart I think, that I think change. You've got to be very hesitant about sort of uh, ascribing a single view to Britons in that interwar period, because actually the, I mean, the war is very controversial whilst it's being fought, and it remains very controversial afterwards. But certainly, I think there's a uh, there's both a much broader range of opinion which says the conflict was worth fighting and it was for something, and of course it's much harder to say it was worth nothing whilst so many people have lost loved ones. So this was a kind of structural factor in what, what can, exactly what can actually be said. Uh, and of course, uh, yeah, that idea, one of the ways that society deals with that idea of uh, this kind of controversy, but simultaneously this great uh, uh, tragedy of so much loss of life, is to try and come to a kind of mutually acceptable meaning. A, and I think you see that transition from the 1920s going into the 1930s, so that you get this idea that this was a war justified by the achievement of peace. Uh, which I think is a very important way actually of then looking at Britain's involvement with Europe in the 1930s and 
how uncontroversial the start of the Second World War is. It, um, it causes much less debate uh, popularly, uh, 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 um, politically, going to war in September 1939, not just because it's seen as a war for peace. So the sacrifice of 1914-18 will only be justified if uh, Britain stands up for peace you know, and uh, redeems those, uh, those dead soldiers. Uh, but it's really only, I think, in the, uh, the post-Second World War era that you have a rewriting of that uh, the experience of the First World War in more purely negative terms. Uh, so, I mean, partly that's because you have a comparison. So, so you can have a good war and a bad war. Britain's Second World War is better in the sense that it loses fewer people. Uh, whether it's, I mean, I think one of the other aspects of goodness that we associate with the Second World War is the achievement of sort of social welfare reform at the end of it. Of course, you know, again, what's often forgotten is how important for, in, in terms of improving the conditions of working class Britons, the experience of the First World War is. The, you know, the fact that trade unions take advantage of wartime labour shortage to strike and get better rates of pay is, and, uh, well, but more particularly, I think, uh, 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 in terms of working class family incomes, just the sheer level of employment, uh, you know, this that makes the, second, the First World War a transformative uh, moment as well. Uh, and then, of course, you know, wars are always repurposed, revisited over time in history. I don't think the, you know, there's always been an undercurrent of questioning, even when the First World War is seen in more negative terms, about is, is it really a bad war? So, I mean, it's distinctive that we're having a debate today. I, mean, I think one of the things that actually happens with the, the remembrance of the First World War is it becomes remembered in terms of debates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those, those debates can be used to they, they're a key part of people's political and personal identities. So actually one of the things that even people who might not know very much about the First World War, they know about there were some debates, there were some things that people argue about, and I know where I stand on those debates, and that's part of what makes me who I am. Um, but in fact, the, the origins of the war, the, the reasons Britain went to war in both the First and the Second World War are actually quite similar. And when you talk about the, the effects in terms of labour, in terms of welfare, they are again strikingly similar. You know, we did not go to war in the Second World War, however much we like to think that to save the Jews, we did not do, we did not know about Auschwitz. We went for remarkably similar reasons for the reasons we fought the First World War. If you want to say there's more a mixture of uh, morality and uh, geopolitics both times around, you know, yeah, I think that there's, that's a good way of explaining why British statesmen and population are persuaded to fight twice over. But we do seem to have a, turn, a turning point round about the 60s. Everyone remembers <coughs> the BBC's great series, The Great War, um, which is still striking now when you see people in their 60s and 70s who fought on the Somme and Eep. Um, and you also get the first real public airing of <coughs> Wilfred Owen's poems in, in the War Requiem. Uh, oh, what a lovely war, of course, comes through that. What's that turning point about? What does it represent? Well, I know Dan would actually place the turning point a little later, which actually I don't agree with him on, but I think uh, we've had many arguments about this. Um, I think the 1960s, uh, it's, it is, it is, I think, the, the generation actually now viewing the First World War through the prism of the Second World War. The good, the good war refracts the bad war, if I put it like that. There's a lot of other things going on as well. Um, uh, J.B. Priestley, for example, who um, writes very movingly, uh, in the late 1950s of his experiences of the First World War. But he sees this uh, as, you know, through, through the eyes of, of, a, of a, I think, a founder member of CND, that certainly, oh, what a lovely war. The background to it is the Cold War, and this idea of the First World War is uh, this tragic mistake, and we'd be going down that slippery slide again. I can't remember exactly when, oh, what a lovely war is premised. Yes, I know, 63, but within six months or so of the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's, it's, it's very close. I think it's the second half. Okay, but, but, but we're talking about um, that sort of, sort of reaction. I think the other thing is that there is this more general, um, the whole, you know, I don't want to overcook this, the whole idea of, of, of the 1960s people being you know, hippies and dropping out the rest of it. But there is, I think, undoubtedly, a backlash against the, if you like, Edwardian conformist, uh, uh, conformism uh, personified by, by Harold Macmillan. And I think the First World War is caught up with that whole sort of, again, not, don't make too much of it, but countercultural idea of the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Pill, and all the rest and of Mac it. Macmillan's very much the symbol of that. And, 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 and he is, of course, yeah. Macmillan, you know, is a, is a grenadier officer in the yeah. war. And I think that the, 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 the First World War <coughs> becomes involved in these sort of wider societal changes. And 
I can't remember whether, whether Dan made this point of his writing or read it somewhere else, but it's also the fact, you know, you, you, you do have at this stage grand grandfathers who fought in the war sitting down with their grandchildren and talking about it, their discussions being prompted by watching the Great War TV series and, and various other things that were going on. I mean, I think that, that it's, uh, that's where you get that intersection, which, which in, you know, once you start to analyse it, it looks very strange, of Alan Clark and Joe Littlewood. <laughs> uh, but of course, you know, I think what links those is Clark is writing as a sort of, um, uh, this is about a different sort of class struggle, this is the up and coming uh, technocrats versus the old aristocratic elite. Yeah. So the, 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 the lesson that he, I mean, part of the point of writing the donkeys is just to impact the bourgeoisie and make a, a, a kind of name for himself, because he, he felt that being a novelist, he wanted to try something new, and right? so the first world war was always going to be. Making uh, a few bob as well. Yeah, yeah no, of course. Uh, but but the, you know, the standpoint there is of, uh, uh, you know, that it, it's, a, it's, it's uh, the middle class who are technically adept, take, you know, wanting to, to sweep away an older system. Right? So I don't think that's, that's a bit different from hippies and, uh, you know, tuning in and dropping out, which I think is much more 1970s. This is a debate that's going on Britain from the 1930s onwards, and you see it there at the end of the 1930s, this idea of the generals in the last war didn't know what they were doing, they didn't deal with technology well, and it's significant that it's focused so much on technology. It's not an accurate reflection of them, mm. but it, it, that, that thing of, well, Britain needs to remake itself by being really good at using these new weapons of war, is something that you see time and time again. <coughs> what's in, Sorry. Come here. What's interesting is that the, um, the sort of parallel debates that I just sketched up that are happening for the centenary, that also happened for the 50th anniversary, that while in this country these debates were going on, in Germany the debate was again about war guilt, this time round um, the argument that it had been Germany's fault was debated um, in, in the media because that had been really very much buried by the late 1930s. Everybody had agreed that it was kind of nobody's fault. Uh, in particular, the system had broken down, and that was very comfortable for Germans. So, um, and, and, the, and the contemporary background to that debate, again, is, is significant. When you mentioned the Cuban Missile Crisis, but obviously also in, in the 1960s, you have the Berlin Wall. You have the fact that Germany is at the very forefront of the Cold War, and now you get a German historian, not an Australian historian teaching in Cambridge, and a German historian saying, it was us. Um, and so um, that's, that's very uncomfortable. So the debates that, that, that Germans have about the war are, are completely different. And, and I think apart from the, the issue of the origins, the First World War itself has never been in any way problematized in, in Germany. It's never actually been debated. The war itself is just a complete non-topic. It's obviously a non-topic in, in, uh, in the immediate um, years after the war because, you know, well, the Germans lost the war, and you know, not only do they feel they didn't start it, they also feel they didn't really lose it. But there they are, um, and um, so you know, that's that's a, you have a different relationship with with that war because of because of its outcome. Um, and then after the Second World War, well, it was just so much more gruesome for Germans than than even the First World War. Although startlingly, the um, the civilian deaths um, are similar. Um, as I um, hadn't really clocked, but um, was pointed out to, to me just earlier, 700,000 German citizens, <coughs> if you include the um, influenza dead. Um, but that is completely um, overlooked in Germany, and, and really to this day, it is, I'd say, in the last two years maybe, that there's this sudden interest in, in the First World War, which suddenly in Germany is called the Great War. I'm not quite sure why that's significant. I think it is significant. I don't quite know what it means, but suddenly it has just completely changed. The, the way Germans see the war has completely changed. I, 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 I think we are sort of, we, we seem to be shadowing um, the, the kind of Gove argument, really, which, which in, in its essence um, is saying that the way we view the First World War is based upon um, trendy views that were developed in the 1960s. It's reflected in things like Oh, what a lovely war. It's reflected a little bit later in Blackadder um, and so on. That is, in, in a sense, that traditional view of the First World War is a construct um, of relatively recent times. Now, that only works if you can't see what is happening inside European society and inside the European armed forces that are engaged at the time of the First World War. It is absolutely right 
that a very large proportion of those who were conscripted to fight or volunteered to fight when it broke out in 1914 were gulled by the dominant ideas of the time, the nationalism, the imperialism, the racism, all of the other ideas that were used to mobilize people and get them into the trenches and get them killing workers in uniform and peasants in uniform on the other side. But there was a minority, a significant minority, that opposed it from the very, very beginning. And that minority got bigger and bigger and bigger until across Europe, across the fighting fronts, there was a wave of mutinies um, and mass desertion and revolutionary movements among the soldiers, which shut down the war on the Eastern Front in 1917 and then shut down the war on the Western Front in 19. And on the Home Front, a wave of strikes that culminated in a tidal wave of revolution that swept across Europe between 1917 and 1923 and actually brought the entire system, the entire European state system, the entire European capitalist system, <coughs> close to collapse. We got closer then, but I think, than, than at any other time in human history. That creates the legacy. That creates a mass opinion <coughs> that says this was an appalling slaughter. And why is it so different, the reaction to what is going on in 1918, than it has been before? It's because war has changed. It's because they have turned war into an industrial process. Up until this point, armies were relatively small. They tended to fight discrete campaigns in particular places, in distant places. What's happening now, from 1914 onwards, is that entire societies are completely engulfed by industrialized slaughter. And the products of human ingenuity, human engineering, human labor, are turned into a vast mechanism for the destruction of life. That's why the slaughter is so massive. That's why the reaction is so huge. And that's why we have today a mass anti-war movement. That is the real legacy of the First World War, the size of the anti-war movement. And in a way, I do wish that was a legacy. I'd be much more pessimistic than you are. I think the really awful lesson of the First World War is actually uh, this isn't something that creates uh, a mass anti-war movement in many of the participant countries. The appalling lesson that we have to learn from this conflict is the, the ability of human societies, which in many ways bring a great deal of good to their members, to self-delude into fighting these appallingly, these grotesque conflicts, which kill millions of people, which in, you know, inflict this grotesque damage. But that's not something which is just inflicted on people from above. Sadly, this is something which is driven by popular emotion from below as well. And, you know, okay, uh, you know the, the German army on the Eastern Front doesn't break down in 1917. Yeah, that's quite significant for what happens on the Eastern Front in 1917. The, the Allied armies don't break down on the Western Front in 1918. Again, that's quite significant for the outcome of the war. So I, 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 I think the really interesting point that you raise, and the thing which is you know, significantly absent from all the discussions about uh, commemoration, is how do we commemorate 1917? There's been very little thought about that. But that's actually, once you get into that, from you know, that period of great upheaval uh, that lasts long after 1918, these are actually much more difficult things for national governments to commemorate. <coughs> you know, I think one of the things that we'll agree on is Michael Gove, if he's still in office, is going to have a ter terrible difficulty trying to work out, well, how do you cast a, uh, uh, a conservative narrative around 1917? <laughs> <laughs> it strikes me, um, that, uh, the purchase of the First World War on, on, on Britain is, is as strong as it's ever been, perhaps stronger. And I'm thinking in particular of poppy wearing now, which, which is far greater and seems much more, more ubiquitous than it was when I was a child, um, even though there were people from, from the First World War there then. Uh, Newsreaders start putting them on about late September these days. But there was a very interesting point, I want to open this up to the audience um, next, but there was just one interesting point by an Irish historian, I, I'm, I'm sure you know him, um, Edward Madigan, um, who uh, had an interesting point about why the British, and I think he specifically said the English, were so obsessed by the First World War. And he said it was the only opportunity, perhaps, he was just surmising, 
but he said perhaps it was the only opportunity the English had to present themselves as victims. Um, and I think that's quite quite an interesting point. But on just on that, we can uh, open it up to the um, you, sir. I immediately caveat that by saying that the arms race, um, there is no real evidence that arms races automatically lead, uh, lead to war. The French, um, uh, British naval arms race la late 19th century didn't. Thankfully, the American Soviet arms race, nuclear arms race of the 70s and 80s didn't. And by 1914, even the Anglo-German arms race had, had really led with the, with the Germans being defeated in the sense that the British had uh, outbuilt them and, and so the German plan for, uh, for undermining the Royal Navy's march of security had failed. What it had done, of course, was to poison relations between Britain and Germany. Uh, it actually took a complete uh, stroke of genius for Britain to get into bed not only with France, traditional enemy, but Russia, its great imperial rival over India. And yes, that, of course, that's what happened between 1904 and 1907. So, your point, um, I think, you know, imperialism helped create preconditions in which war might occur. But to quote David Stevenson, who I think is probably, uh, uh, in, in my view, one, one of the shrewdest historians writing on the First World War at the moment, he said, Europe might have been a house of cards in 1914, but it still took somebody to topple the cards. I just wanted to ask uh, a couple of questions. The first is, I'd like to know what the panel thinks about the whole period from the uh, scramble for Africa to 1914, because it seems to me this is absolutely central to the building up of different rivalries, to the way in which you have competition between the big empires, and that this has an effect on the kind of rivalry which then leads with the arms race and if you remember the dreadnoughts that Lloyd George built they what well, they doubled the amount of spending on dreadnoughts in the years before the first world war what impact does that have and second I'd like to ask particularly to Annika but I find it almost unbelievable that people can say that after the first world war Germany didn't talk about the war the whole of the process up to 1933 and the rise of Hitler was precisely about what the war had caused, the outcome of the war, the Versailles Treaty, all of those things. People and people came out of the war hating the war. They didn't want another war. And that, it seems to me, is very, very important. In the 20s and 30s, people knew the consequences of the war. And actually, the, the, the picture we get of the war today comes from the witnesses to the war. It comes from Robert Graves. It comes from Wilfred Allen. It comes from the people who lived through it. And, and it comes from all quiet on the Western Front. It comes from all of those things. And it seems to me we have to actually understand that and not allow the kind of Michael Gove view of the 60s which made us all soft and we should get back to militarism again. Well, of course you're right that there is all quiet on the Western Front and, and there, is, there is engagement with the war in that way, but I don't think it is the same as it is in this country. It is a different relationship because the, the attitude towards the First World War in Germany is, is one of um, anger. It's, it's a country that does not make its peace with the end of the war in the way that I think Britain does make its peace. The, the idea is that at least um, the, the sacrifices were worth it because this was the war to end all wars and you can believe that until another war breaks out. Well in Germany that's not really the attitude. Um, you are completely right that Versailles and the outcome of the war is a huge topic in Germany and it is, um, it is a topic that unites practically every German, regardless of their, um, their position, the very left and very right, um, agree on, on the fact that Versailles, that, that the, um, the war guild ruling in particular, has to be undone, that this was, this was um, um, a victor's piece, that um, this is just the absolute, the most shameful thing. And that is one of the reasons um, why Hitler comes to power, because he can harness this anger. Um, but it is a completely different attitude to the First World War in Germany to in Britain. So if I said that nobody thinks about the war, that's clearly not the case. But, but they, they think of it differently, partly because they lost it and partly because they cannot make their peace with the peace. And so when you then get um, um, 
Hitler in, in 1937 when he says in the, in the Reichstag, you know, I finally um, rubbed out that signature from the treaty that was um, um, forced out of us and I finally returned Germany back from being like a leper among the nations, back to its former glory, then that sort of ends, ends this, this yeah, nearly 20 year struggle which is all about undoing the outcome of the war. So it's a very different um, way of relating to the war than there is in this country. And, and if you're mentioning remark, of course, it's very controversial. It's not like here, where most people seem to share this notion that the war was, was a terrible experience. You mean, uh, Remarque's book is one of the ones that gets burned by the Nazis, precisely because that's not what they want to hear. They want to hear that it's, it's going to be okay to fight another war, and this time we're going to win. So, Ernest Young, quite valuable reading yes. for that perspective. Yes. You were a woman in the black t-shirt. Um, <coughs> Um, thank you. Um, for, yeah, my um, the first thing I, I mean I was wondering about is the idea of popular consent, which I really just don't buy. Um, I mean, if you once you were in the trenches, if you didn't go over the top in the trenches, um, you did face getting shot. So I don't see how um, I don't see how you can argue that it is popular consent. It's either going you know going kill those Germans or kill those British people or or get shot yourself. Um, and then the, the second thing is just really on the idea of sort of. Britain good, Germany bad. I mean, would you really argue um, that that is the case? I mean, would you really try and put that argument to in somewhere like India, you know, where you know, or, or other uh, British colonies where there was no democracy? I just don't buy the idea of Britain as some kind of beacon of democracy and civility. I don't and think anyone is suggesting that. In fairness, I don't think anyone has ever said Germany bad, Britain good on this panel. Well, that's what I think we're dealing with shades of grey there. Can I well, you? well, the, the the gentleman on the end said, "I'm very glad that my country went to war. My ancestors went to war, and we came out on the winning side." Mm -hmm. But I think it um, that's that was my question. I mean, I don't. I think it's more complex. Okay, well, let him answer yeah. that, then. Gary. Well, if I take take the first one about consent, um, you're actually wrong about what kept British troops in the in in the in the trenches. Um, it was very largely a combination of comradeship, belief in cause, really basic things like having the rations arriving on time, mail arriving from home, that sort of thing. 350-ish um, uh, British soldiers were executed for military uh, crimes during the Great War out of an army of 5.4 million. Um, the va oh, sorry, 5.4 5, 5. million or so served in the army at some point during the war. Um, a large number of the people who were executed were repeat offenders. Um, British army discipline could be pretty harsh, could be pretty brutal, but the idea of people, you know, stood a, 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 a really good chance of being shot if they deserted or went absent without leave is simply untrue. And a really key reason why people stayed in the trenches was excellent leadership <coughs> at junior officer level. Um, our, to put it very crudely, once the public school boys had, had been killed off at the beginning of the war, they were replaced from people from all parts of society. About 40% of all officers in 1918 were from a, uh, from a lower class or lower middle class background. And they were paternal. They looked after their men. The soldiers were perfectly capable of telling them where to get off if their, their side of the, of the bargain was broken. There were a few isolated mutinies, but they tended to be very much against local, local conditions. And that sort of solidarity, which saw the forces of the British Empire through to conclusion in 1918, um, that solidarity broke down in the French army in 1917, though it was rebuilt. It certainly broke down in the German army in the Hundred Days victorious offences of 1918. Uh, and Italians and, and, and the Austro-Hungarians went much the same way. British really were the only major force whose armies were in the field for any length of time, which did not undergo a serious mutiny while the war was going on. Afterwards, different matter. People joined up to beat the Kaiser, they'd done it, they wanted to go home. They did all sorts of things, including burning down Luton Town Hall. But there was a basic um, commitment to the calls, to their officers, which kept the, the soldiers going throughout, throughout the, the, the very grim conditions in the trenches. Can I, can I paint that yeah, in a sure. different, different light? Because I, I 
I, I picture things in a much less cosy way than Gary does, uh, uh, you know, not, not, in the, not just in the armed forces, but nationally. But I think that question of popular consent is one where actually the best research historically is now being done, but it's an area where there is more research that, that's needed. But it seems to me that an awful lot of what that is pointing to is the extent to which the war is experienced at a very, very local level. Right? So not as not just as Britons or Germans, or, but inhabitants of, of counties, of particular towns, particular villages. And I think there is a very interesting question about how the dynamics of consent work at that level. Right? So how is it that these, at this kind of micro level, uh, societies across Europe, depending on your perspective, are persuaded, are gold, or persuade themselves uh, to fight. But I don't, for me, there can't be much argument that the only way in which these societies can sustain this war for so long is because they have the consent of their populations. Right? So that's, that's not to say uh, this is something which everybody is willingly serving in, because that's obviously not the case. Right? But the majority of the population in all of those combatant countries supports the war for quite a long time. Uh, and again, I think that's, that's a question, for me, that's a much more interesting question actually than whose fault is it that the war starts? Right? It's why do so many people across Europe keep fighting it even when it's obvious it's, go it's not going to be over quickly, it's going to keep going and it's going to be horrible. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's one, you know, there's an excellent book by Katrina Pennell called A Kingdom United which looks at responses, it's very, very local archival level. And that's, I think, if you want to know more about how people respond to the war, that's where you've got to go back to is those little local archives right, and find out what are people doing, how do they respond to this news of the war arriving. Lady there. Hi, thanks. Hi, um, I have a question which I'd like <coughs> some panel members to try and have a stab at. As we've been talking about British Libraries Europeana project, <coughs> uh, next Monday BBC will uh, announce the first, I think it's 200 episodes of 1400 of uh, World War One at home. We are in this situation where we're really kind of contemplating the relationship of the local to the global. What are your kind of hopes and fears and aspirations for what we might achieve through this talking through this debate um, within Britain and Britain's place within the world over the next four to five years? Well, um, let me say that I'm not terribly interested in Britain's place in the world because um, I don't see Britain as a unified entity. I see Britain as a class society. And what I'm interested in um, is the well-being of the great majority of ordinary British people um, who are, at the moment, are under massive attack by a neoliberal elite. And we talked a little bit about the Second World War and the legacy of the Second World War, a neoliberal elite that is determined to destroy the greatest achievement of the British people uh, in the 20th century, which is the construction of the welfare state in the 25 years or so after the Second World War. And when you look at who is doing that and who supports that project, it is a neoliberal elite of bankers and industrialists and millionaire politicians. It's the same sort of people, actually, as made the decision to go to war in 1914. So it's not really a question of Britain's position in the world. It's much more a question of how are working people in Britain going to organise themselves along with working people in other countries to resist what is coming down the road. That's partly um, neoliberal cuts, austerity cuts, which will return us to the kind of position that we were in in, in the interwar, interwar period. But it's also about this. It's also about support for new military interventions in other parts of the world designed to shore up the big corporations that are based um, in, in, in the Western world. And we have no interest in those wars as ordinary people any more than we have any interest in the austerity cuts, but our rulers do. The main enemy is at home, not abroad. Uh, so, <laughs> so I think I can answer the question. Um, so my, my view is that if, if, if there's two, if there's two things I'd like to come out of the, set, the the next four years, one is that some people who who don't know anything about the war and think think they're not interested in it, find out a bit more about it and find out actually they are interested, and the people who already think they know about the war have cause to think about why they know what they know 
and they can stick with their opinions or they can change them, but they at least reflect on why do they know what they already know. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we can manage that, I think there would have been, been some success. So, you know, uh, fortunately there's a solution for Neil there because hopefully what happens is that the process of talking about why do societies consent to fight this war uh, uh, 100 years ago is a way of getting people to think about why do they not uh, conduct greater disruption to stop wars being fought today. It does seem absolutely crucial, I think, as, as, as someone involved in public history, to emphasise the global aspect of the war and, and, and to get away from this rather parochial uh, obsession uh, with the Western Front. You know, this, this, this took place elsewhere. Countries as Brazil was involved, or Turkey. The aspect, the whole theatre of the Middle East is important. And I think one of the reasons why Christopher Clarke's book, The Sleepwalkers, has been a success, not just in Germany but here as well, is because it offers, it, its focus is essentially on Central Europe, about which many of us, including myself, are very, very ignorant so far as the First World War goes. So I think what we should do over the next few years is to try and open up those vistas and, and bring to, One thing that worries me about the local <coughs> is the fact that we become obsessed by the local and forget the bigger picture and forget the high politics, forget the diplomacy. They all matter and they all have to be connected. And I think what has happened with the First World War in particular, but a lot of history lately, is it's become focused on the individual and tracing the individual, and it's some kind of sort, search for authenticity. And I don't think that's a good thing. You have to bring <coughs> the whole picture. Annika. Yeah, you asked um, what are we worried about, I, and it goes, um, I think, a long way towards what you're saying, but I, I'm worried about a development of different national stories about the war and I think that is what's happening um, not just re with regard to the causes but with regard to the, the whole history of the war that we're not integrating these stories and that we're in danger of having conflicting um, views of the war and I don't think that's very helpful and I'm also a bit worried that we are going to see World War One fatigue setting in before we've got to uh, 2018. Before we got to August. Yeah. Since we were talking about Germany, um, following the fall of the Soviet Union, has there been a reassessment of World War One from a Russian perspective? Oh, well, interesting because I, I, um, uh, I, I was giving a paper in um, in Cambridge about uh, uh, sort of public history of the war uh, um, last week. And uh, uh, I was I was talking to a, a Russian historian there who said what's striking is how little how, the, how little their inter interest there is in preserving <coughs> any any bit of First World War history that's left how little knowledge there is of what little there is that remains that there is a there's still a very heavy archival presence in all sorts of archives but that access interest in accessing it or doing anything with it is it, it's it's not part of the story that the Russian regime at the moment wants to wants to tell. I don't know. I mean, it's, again, 90, uh, 2017 is going to be very interesting because it's very hard to see how you could avoid doing something with 2017. Uh, but quite how you construct that into a Putinist narrative, <laughs> I, 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 I have no idea. Uh, but I think that's the great. I mean, that that's the. I mean, uh, the the for remembrance in in the UK for all that we debated is very easy. If you end up on, you know, if the country ends up on the winning side in two wars, it, there's not actually that much that's controversial. Whilst the, I mean, there's still a lot we can fight about, empire and all sorts of other things, right? But remember, it's for countries that, that, that are torn aside by population movements, by genocide, you know, several times over the course of the, the 20th century, it's much, much more difficult. Now, how do you, it seems to me the tragedy that we ought to be talking about is not really focusing on Britain at all, but it's, it's what happens on the Eastern Front. And, and again, maybe that should be our third aim, is if, if people in Britain at the end of 2018 are cognizant that the war isn't just fought by uh, some khaki figures in a trench somewhere in Belgium with maybe a few field grade Germans on the far side, but that's it. Which it really is some, you know, the perspective that some British soldiers have at the time. But there's, a, there's something else going on on the other side of Europe. I think that would be really, a really, really useful development. The man at the back of the beard. Um, how the, the big question, well one of the big questions is how likely would the Second World War have been if the First World War had never somehow been allayed or 
had been a minor conflict, um, you know, personally, I think it, there's a good chance it may not have happened, but obviously to do with Hitler's um, <coughs> sense of revenge about Versailles and everything. So, you know, how, how likely is it that Second World War wouldn't have happened? Gary. One of, the, uh, one of the myths of the First World War is that the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 led directly to the outbreak of the Second World War. You know, so do not pass go, do not collect £200. Actually, um, there's all sorts of reasons why Versailles might actually have worked. There's a separate argument, which is that the real problem with, with Versailles, well, it's just two things. First of all, that Versailles, uh, having been imposed on the Germans in 1919, the Allies then simply did not enforce it. The French were very keen on enforcing the, the, uh, the terms, the British and the Americans much less so, and so the Germans spotted weaknesses which, which they could exploit. The second argument is that um, in the Treaty of Versailles brought about absolutely the worst of all worlds, that actually it enraged the Germans without taking away Germany's ability to resort to arms at some point in the future. Versailles is, has, has this reputation as, as a very harsh Carthaginian peace. It wasn't. Something like Brest-Litovsk imposed on Bolshevik Russia by the Germans in 19, seven, 1918 was a, was, was a Carthaginian peace. What happens to Germany in 1945 is there's no formal peace process at all, but it is the destruction of an existing social system and being rebuilt. Versailles actually is a very traditional form of peace settlement, albeit quite a harsh one but not harsh enough or not mild enough. In my personal view, the best way to treat Germany in 1919 would have been to, to regard the new um, Republican democratic state as a successor state and actually blame the ills of the recent past on the, on the now departed imperial government and basically give Germany a clean, a clean slate. That was never going to work in the febrile atmosphere of 1919. It was, it was a non-starter. Non, non there's a very strong uh, argument put forward by uh, Philip Bell and Sir Michael Howard, among other people, that actually what causes the Second World War in the form that we know it is not Versailles, but the Great Depression. Because Germany is becoming reconciled, if not to defeat, certainly being brought back into the family of uh, the, the wider international community at the end of the 20s. The Wall Street Depression followed by, uh, the Wall Street crash followed by the Depression, um, smashes that, it, it wrecks what is left of political stability in Germany, uh, eventually of course brings Hitler to power, even though his, that is not necessarily a given. Once Hitler is in power, he is a completely different sort of politician than anybody's seen before. He's determined a war from the very beginning and he wants a, a major war. I can well imagine that without, without the Great Depression, without Hitler coming to power, there's further revision of the Versailles Treaty, which is being revised anyway in the 20s, and possibly a small localised border war between Germany and Poland at some, state, at some, state in which, some stage in which uh, the, the frontiers are amended, but not the cataclysm we actually get in 1939. So, um, the Second World War is a product of the First World War, that's certainly true, but I don't think there's necessarily a direct line between Versailles and what happens in September 1939. Thanks, Gary. I'm afraid... We've reached the end of the uh, of the line here. Um, thankfully, we're not even at August 1914 yet, the anniversary of that. We've got 1915, 16, 17, 18, and even 19 to come. Um, so I've no doubt we'll have many, many more debates. Um, and it's uh, we can see just how much interest there is in this topic from all of you who've come this evening at such short notice. Um, I'm sure we'll have more of these debates because this is a massive, complex, and challenging topic. But thank you for coming and thank you for the British Library as well for organising this. And thank you for